welcomed in Old English means one whose coming suits another's will, wish, and pleasure. On behalf of the Miller family and Young Harris College, I welcome you to this time of remembrance and celebration of the life of Sel B. Miller. Governor, Senator, Statesman, Family Man, and Friend. In our Southern Mountain way of speaking, we have the tendency to merge words. One of my favorites is spit image. We usually hear it as a comparison of a child to a parent. He's the spitting image of his dad. The two words are spirit and image. Young Harris is proud to say that Governor Miller was both the spirit and image of Young Harris College. And I believe that because of his influence, Young Harris is the spirit and image of Zell Miller. If there have ever been two people who represent the white spirit of you can, it has been Zell and Shirley Miller. We are honored to have Governor Miller as a student, a faculty member, and leader. And your presence here would truly suit Governor Miller's will, wish, and pleasure. Well. Please rise as we sing together, Go Tell It on the Mountain. You will find your words printed in your program. God, let us pray. 
Eternal God, as we begin this holy week that calls us to remember the life and ministry of Jesus Christ journeying toward a cross and a tomb, we find assurance in the Easter message that death does not have the final sting. Death is not the end of the story. The glorious resurrection proclaims our hope and our assurance of life and life eternal. We praise you, God of grace and God of glory. We praise you for the great company of saints, all those who have finished their course and faith and now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us whom we name in our hearts before you. But especially this day, we praise you, O God, for this, your faithful servant, Zell Miller, whose impact is known vividly to this community, this state, our country, and most importantly, your kingdom here on earth and in heaven, to whom you have graciously received into your presence. To all of these, grant your peace. Let perpetual light shine upon them and help us, help us so to believe where we have not seen, that your presence may lead us through our years. For those we hold dear that have gone before us, bring us at last with them into the joy of your home, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. We pray this in the name of the creator, the sustainer, and the redeemer of all our lives, the triune God. Amen. Good morning to all our friends. Uh, this is overwhelming to uh, see all of you here. Uh, please just kind of settle in, make yourselves comfortable as we share some time together. My role here, if I get it right, is to be the family member that welcomes you to this homecoming. Uh, you all hear from those that follow about the published, public accomplishments of this man, the Methodist and the Marine. But for now, I invite you to visit with a family man. Zell Brian Miller was born here in this valley, within sight of this campus. He grew up here playing in the creeks and on the ball fields, fatherless, but with an exceptionally gifted mother and an extended family of in-laws, caring friends, and teachers. During his lifetime, Zell's body would travel the world, but his heart and soul always remained in young Harris. He came from a family of teachers, and although he would carry many titles and honorifics, he considered himself a teacher, like his parents. On this campus, he would meet the person who changed his life, Shirley and Carl. All his considerable energies went into this courtship, and their remarkable union lasted over 64 years and produced two children, four grandchildren, eight grandchildren, nephews, nieces, cousins. This woman, along with the family he married, provided a new and exceptionally strong emotional base. Without the character and support of my mom and the Carver clan, Dad's ultimate future would have never been realized. For we see that while Zell spent time changing the state, his family, we see here, remained devoted to him and he was devoted to us. We shared his victories and defeats, and he shared ours. As you know, Zell loved baseball, and it's no surprise that baseball was a metaphor for life in our home. The years were marked by the passing events of the baseball season. Pitchers and catchers report marked a new year with new possibilities. Dad loved to go around announcing pitchers and catchers report. <laughs> he had begun this ritual several weeks before the actual report day. He spent hours with Matt and I teaching us the fundamentals of the game, you know, the importance of the bunt, always keeping your eye on the ball, 
being in position on every pitch, and what he called hustle. You know, the fundamentals. If you didn't know the fundamentals, how could you expect to excel? He preached the gospel of stretching a single into a double. That play requires speed, skill, courage, cunning, all in harmony. With the happy element of surprise to your unwary opponent. And Dad believed you should go for the extra base at every opportunity. To him, this maneuver demonstrated your personal character. At least you had tried something bold. You had come to play. And he always took such delight in this team. And tell me, my friends, who stretched more singles into doubles than Zelda? Zell's favorite play was stealing home. So he would steal home to us when duty would allow. And him coming through the door was our home run. And when we were with him, we didn't talk politics unless it was about Churchill and Jefferson. We talked about books and baseball and gardening and guns and the milestones reached by growing children. He took great pleasure in exploring our current enthusiasms with us, no matter what our age or our interest. This Papa of ours, as he was called, was also a prankster. The man who counseled presidents of the United States on correct government is the same character who counseled his children on the correct method of applying log cabin syrup to doorknobs on April Fool's Day. <laughs> he revered Christmas above all days and spent each Christmas day in the rock house. We flocked like starlings to sit by his Yule fire and to hear him speak to each of us of his unabashed love. He liked Easter too. He would famously hide Easter eggs in plain sight in the branches of trees where his grandchildren could see them but not reach them. <laughs> I thought at the time he was antagonizing them without a purpose, but I like to think now that he wanted them to know that although their goals were in reach, they would still need family in reaching those goals. So for all his public accomplishments, we, his family, we had the best of him. We only shared him with you from time to time. And I'm quick to add, it was our honor and our privilege to do so. So I hope you'll agree that the arrangement worked out well for all of us. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your prayers for my mom.
Zell Brian Miller died on March 23, 2018, but I don't have to believe that if I don't want to. I refuse to accept the notion that that voice has been still. Zell Miller had a voice, famously once described as more barbed wire than honeysuckle. And he found that voice right here in Young Harris. And oh, how that voice carried. From the classrooms of Young Harris College, to the city council, to the state senate, to that gorgeous mansion in Buckhead, to the sacred sanctums of the United States Senate, to the White House, all around the world, that voice, it carried. Lord, did it carry. He used that voice. He used it to, to motivate, to agitate, to excoriate, to educate. But in all the years I've known him, the softest, the sweetest, the most sentimental that voice ever was when he was talking about Shirley. That voice changed when his beloved Shirley was the subject. There is an old saying that behind every successful man there is an astonished spouse. <laughs> and Shirley was his partner, his helpmate, his business manager, his breadwinner, his soulmate, his first lady, in every sense of the word. Zell once said that as a speechwriter, I had put more words in his mouth than Shirley had biscuits. <laughs> so right here, right now, Zell, I'm going to flip the script. I'm going to speak words you put in my mouth. Thank you, Shirley. God bless you, Shirley. We love you, Shirley. You know, Zell once said, my family is more important to me than my party, which we know is true since he only had one family. <laughs> The only person to give the keynote address at both parties to mention. <laughs> but his love for Murphy and Matt, for Asia and Brandon, Jacob and Morgan, Joshua and Caleb, Mary and Braylon, for Justin and Jordan, for Jasmine and Laylee, for Andrew and Allie and Savannah, Matthew, for Anna and for Brian, his grandson, who has done so much work carrying the torch for the Miller Institute Foundation and has done so much to organize these remembrances and these celebrations of this remarkable life. His love for you was boundless. A few weeks ago on Zell's birthday, I sent him a note. Told him that not a day goes by that I don't hear that voice in my head. In fact, just that week I had written a column about the president and Congress and I quoted one of Miller's maxims. Politicians, he said, know two things. What you can do for them and what you can do to them. Three decades after I first heard that voice, I still hear it every day. So many of those Miller's Max, you could fill a book. He filled, I don't know, eight, nine, ten books. Maybe the most famous one was this. If you ever see a turtle up on a fence post, you know one thing. It didn't get there by himself. Somebody had to put it there. Or a hit dog hollers. Or you won't find average Americans on the left or on the right. You'll find them at Walmart. <laughs> He once said about a, about a rival, he doesn't know G from Hall. And another, he said, that guy knows about as much about the South as a hog knows about Sunday. He talks like Dirty Harry, but he acts like Barney Five. And when a child has no hope, a nation has no future. That one's my favorite. Zell Miller was all about hope. In a lifetime of service, it was his crowning accomplishment. After more than a quarter of a century, it is so woven into the fabric of Georgia that we can't imagine life without it. Think about that. Over a quarter of a century, 1.8 million Georgians have gone to college because of Zell Miller and because of Hope. And 1.6 million have gone to pre-kindergarten because of Zell Miller. Nearly 4 million Georgians expanded educational opportunity because of him. That is a remarkable accomplishment, but it really raises two questions. How and why? How? How was he able to do that? In short, because Zell Miller was a genius, an absolute genius. In the art of politics, he was Michelangelo. He knew not only how to win power in election, but how to wield power in office. He knew how to bring heads together and sometimes how to bang heads together. He knew that politics is a team sport. And over the long course of his career, he assembled a remarkable team. 
hundreds and hundreds of people. We all say that we went to Zell Moore University because he taught us and we carried those lessons the rest of his life. Particularly that team in the governor's mansion led by his two chiefs of staff, Keith Mason and Dr. Steve Rigley. He drove that team hard, but he led them to grace. So why? Why did this man apply this remarkable genius to education, economic development, to helping lift up the people that others look down on? Because he'd been there. He never forgot who he was, where he came from, or who sent him. He was Zell Miller, child of a single mother, grew up without running water or electricity or a father. So he decided to dedicate himself and his public service to, and these are his words, dedicating his administration as governor. He said, I devote myself to the family farmer who plants his own crops and bales his own hay, to the small businesswoman who stays open late and calls her customers by their first names, to the senior citizen who opens her utility bill fearing she'll be forced to choose between being cold and being hungry, and to the young family starting out struggling to afford daycare now and save for college later. It is to every family that works and saves and sometimes comes up a little bit short at the end of the month that this administration is dedicated. That's what Zell Miller said. That is the goal to which he applied his genius. And then he set a, a much more clear and specific goal for himself. These are his words. He set the standard for himself. He said, I want to be a governor who made a difference in the lives of our children. Well, Zell, in the words of one of your students, Ronnie Melsap, what a difference you've made in our lives. He sure made a difference in mine. I first met Zell in 1988 at the Democratic Convention in Atlanta. I had been a speechwriter for Dick Gepper, President Gepper, you all remember him. <laughs> <laughs> we won Iowa and then it kind of went off in the ditch. So when it ran off into the ditch, I had the honor of being evicted from my tiny little studio apartment in Washington. So I moved into the tiny little one bedroom apartment of my friend and partner, James Carter. I slept on a sofa. Not something I recommend. <laughs> Unless first you wrap yourself in saran wrap. Um, so there I was, showing up at the big convention in the big city of Atlanta, broke, homeless, and barely employed. But Zell saw something in me. Or rather, he instilled something in me. He gave me hope. He gave me a chance. He gave me a job, and he gave me opportunities, and he gave me humility even when I didn't think I wanted it. I remember once he was giving a speech to the county commissioners. He was running for governor, and his platform was the lottery for education. So, like a dutiful speechwriter, I wrote him a speech about lottery for education. It was boring, but it was, it was what we were running on. <laughs> Zell said, no, these are county commissioners. They want to hear about sewers. That's what they need. They build sewers. Sewers are what make civilization work. That's why I built more sewers than any lieutenant governor in history. And I said, Zell, lottery. He said, sewers, lottery, sewers, lottery. We scream and yell at each other. Finally, he threw up his hand and said, fine, I'll do it, Drew. He took that boring speech, and maybe because he was angry, he breathed such life into it, such passion, <laughs> such excitement. Those county commissioners stood and roared and cheered the standing ovation. <laughs> then, like a fool, I decided to take credit for his performance. And I said to him, well, that went pretty well, didn't it, Zell? And he said, no, no thanks for that speech you wrote me. <laughs> And then when his friend Bill Clinton traveled to Atlanta in 1991 to tell Zell he was thinking about running for president, Zell suggested that he hire, as he put it, those boys that worked for me, James Carver and Paul McGowan. I don't believe Governor Clinton had ever heard of us, but out of respect for Zell, that very day he gave us a call. And then he gave us a chance. I owe this man so much more than I can ever repay. Zell was the only client in the storied history of the farm of Carvel and Begala for whom, in our contract with him, instead of a win bonus of cash, the bonus was he had to take us to spring training for the Braves. <laughs> Every year, if we look forward to it, I mean like a five-year-old looks forward to Christmas. Zell introduced us to his great friend Hank Aaron, an American legend, who so admired Zell. He introduced me to Mickey Mantle, who so looked up to Zell that when Mickey was in the hospital in Dallas fighting for his life, Zell went to go visit him. And the nurse came in and said, uh, I'm sorry, Governor, visiting hours are, are over. You're going to have to leave. And Mickey said, no, he stays. And the nurse said, well, Mr. Mantle, you know it's after 5 o'clock. And after 5 o'clock, it's family only. And the mix sat up in that bed, and he said, ma'am, that's my father. 
I know how you feel. <laughs> well, on one of those spring training trips, it was a game starting at 1.05 p.m. So, of course, Sergeant Miller ordered his troops to be in the van and moving by 9 a.m. So I saunter out the door of the hotel at 9.01 just to see the taillights of the van <laughs> heading out of that party. So I ran after him. He took pity on me and let me in. And I asked him, I said, Senator, why are you such a stickler for punctuality? The game doesn't start for four hours. He said he'd learned that in the Marine Corps where men's lives depended on you being in the right place at the right time. And he turned to me and he, fact, he said, in fact, everything you need to know in life, I learned in the Marine Corps. And core values, one of his finest books, was born. Zell was a walking contradiction, a lifelong insider who always felt like an outsider, a career politician practically from the day he took that Marine uniform off, and yet he never lost a working man's contempt for the phoniness and pretense of politicians. A deeply devoted Christian who cussed like a Marine sergeant. <laughs> he one time said, my mouth is not a prayer book. <laughs> Sir. He was one of the finest orders our nation has ever seen, and yet one of his most famous quotations is, where I come from, deeds matter more than words. He was respected and feared in the corridors of power, and yet he always felt most at home right here in the bosom of these North Georgia mountains. In that old rock house, which his beloved mother bird had built with her bare hands. And so it was only fitting and proper that the love of his life brought him home to that house to breathe his last and then to go home to the arms of a loving God. He once said, when I was growing up back in the mountains, whenever I felt like one of life's losers, my mother used to point to the one and only paved road in our little valley a narrow little strip that disappeared winding into a gap. And she'd say to me, Zell, you know what the great thing about living here is? From here, you can get anywhere in the world. Yes, Miss Birdie. Yes, you can. Your boy Zell did. But here's something else about these mountains. When a voice rings out here, strong and stirring and proud and powerful, that voice does not disappear. It comes back to you bouncing off the mountains and echoing through the valleys and singing through the hollows. It never really leaves you. The voice of this good and great man who I love so much, that distinctive, beautiful voice, will echo forever. God bless you, Zell.
I am honored to speak today, and like you, so grateful to know Zell and Shirley Miller. Shirley asked that we talk about Zell the man. I'm not worthy even to try. But when Shirley asked, the answer is yes. So I will do my best as we honor this special man. Zell Miller was born during the Great Depression, a time of poverty, here in the Georgia mountains, then a place of isolation, in a rented house nearby this Methodist college, to a mother who 17 days later would be widowed. These are facts, being poor, being isolated, being fatherless, being religious, and being educated that shaped Zell Miller's life. He grew up in the shadow of this college where his father, Grady, taught. Grady was politically active and supported Ed Rivers, the progressive governor who challenged the Gene Talmadge faction. His mother also taught at Young Harris and remarkably studied art in New York, quite a distinction for a woman from the South in the early 20th century. She nurtured in Zell a love for education and a desire to make a difference. He grew up in the South, proud of its poverty, whose politicians were landmarks, often with good reason. Too many Southern politicians took pride in their backwardness, even as people left their states in droves for opportunities in the North. All that began to change in the 1960s, when a new generation of governors was elected and wanted better for their citizens. So this was the backdrop to Zell's passion for politics, a stagnant economy that led to personal incomes in Georgia trailing far behind the nations. And because he saw education as the key to prosperity, it bothered Zell that so few Georgians had a bachelor's degree. This backdrop sparked an ambition in him to transform Georgia so its people could realize their dreams the same way the people of California, Wisconsin, and New York did. You know the outline of his political career, so I won't recount it here. He had a wide range of interests and a roving intellect, devouring information, and generating long lists of ideas on a yellow legal pad. So where to begin to capture the intellect, the energy, and the passion of the man who left this beautiful valley determined to change our state? We have to begin with his love for these mountains. These mountains composed his soul. He missed them when he was away. He talked about this place, this valley and these mountains, as if they were alive. And they certainly brought life to him. He wrote about them in his first book and in his last. Zell never forgot where he came from. And he had a fierce pride in the history, culture, and language of these majestic hills. His education here instilled in Zell a love for words. He had a curiosity about language. He wondered where words came from, why we pronounced them differently, why he said purr and the rest of us said poor. He was a gifted speaker with a distinctive voice. Speeches mattered to him. And he didn't just write a speech, he crafted it. He spent hours laboring over the text testing different phrases, changing words until he had the speech exactly the way he wanted it. Then he practiced it, committing it to memory, and only then was he ready to deliver it in that voice, yes, he himself described as more barbed wire than honeysuckle. Zell was an historian, earning a master's in history at the University of Georgia with a thesis on his father's hero, Ed Rivers. When new books came out, he would buy and read and analyze them, before the rest of us even knew they were on sale. Have you read the new one about Theodore Roosevelt, he would ask. You don't have it? Well, I read it last night, he would say, with the tone that implied, what exactly are you doing in your spare time? <laughs> Zell loved baseball and visiting spring training. He studied catchers, their techniques. Who does that? But that was the range of his intellectual curiosity. He loved the New York Yankees, and Mickey Mantle was his hero and later his friend. Zell was a Marine and proudly so. He credited the Marine Corps for drilling in him a discipline that molded his natural abilities. When you take Zell's kind of energy 
in his kind of creativity and his ability to use language, and you discipline and focus them, they become a powerful force for good. He loved to eat, especially with his family, Shirley, Murphy, Matt, the extended family, and with his friends. Creme brulee was a favorite dessert, and he enjoyed sharing it. As he traveled, he always ordered it and could tell you where to find the best creme brulee, not only in Georgia, but the nation. But Chinese food, here or there, he could not abide. Bird's nest soup. We found the limit of his intellectual curiosity. <laughs> Zell had a sharp sense of humor, which he often trained on himself, as when he described his less than textbook run for the United States Senate in 1980. I wanted to run for the Senate in the worst way, and I did, he would say. <laughs> and he could poke fun at you, too. When I left the governor's staff, Zell and Shirley hosted a wonderful party at the mansion. The senior staff generously presented me a case of red wine, whereupon Zell quipped, that's about a week's supply. <laughs> Zell did not like an entourage. He chafed at having security. To be clear, he loved the men and women who protected him, and he honored their service. He just liked his space, his independence. Many of you know there's a back door to the governor's office, so a governor, so inclined, can slip out of the Capitol, unseen by the staff. And from time to time, we would go into the office, and there would be no governor. That was always a little unsettling. But soon he would return, and with an impish grin, say, well, I walked down to underground to get some yogurt. <laughs> he was a perfectionist about everything, his speeches, his policies, events. Zell spent months working on a Hope Scholarship to get it exactly the way he wanted it. At events, he would fret about color schemes and table settings just because he wanted things to be perfect. He would not accept second-rate effort from himself or anyone else. Zell had a remarkable political radar. In the late 1980s, he felt the time was right to establish a state lottery and dedicate the in income to new education programs. When he announced he would lead the charge to create a lottery, his opponents thought he was nuts, only to be left in his way as he outlined how its revenue could help transform the state. His equal partner is Shirley, a charming first lady and unique person. They brought a special relationship to the governor's mansion. She understood him, she motivated him, she scolded him, she kept him on the right path. Zell did not do anything without Shirley. We once attended a National Governors Association dinner in another state, a very nice event for several hundred people. We, of course, arrived early, even before the host governor, who clearly did not share Zell's view of punctuality. We quick, quickly realized it was a fancy dinner, with place cards at every setting, and where someone thought it would be sophisticated to ensure no one sat with anyone they knew, including spouses. Well, that is not how the governor of Georgia ate supper. I ate supper with Shirley, he told us. And then, with the wait staff watching, puzzled, the governor of Georgia proceeded to rearrange the place cards so that the Georgia delegation was seated together with Zell and Shirley side by side. And that is how he always wanted them. Zell and Shirley side by side. That was the kind of love and respect he had for her, for her judgment, for her accomplishments, for her understanding of him, because he knew that she knew him. She had his number and his back, and he loved her for it. The last time I saw him, he was in Union General Hospital, fighting the ultimate battle. On the elevator ride up, I stared at the wall, thinking about the privilege we all shared to have been part of his orbit. And a little sign on that elevator wall slowly came into focus. In large letters were the words, pre-K, and underneath, free state preschool for four-year-olds. And it gave a contact number for those who were interested. 
What a reach that man had. What a mark he left. And what fun he had doing. His ambition to make his state better and create more opportunities for Georgians was fulfilled. National acclaim rolled in. Newsweek, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, the Washington Times, the Los Angeles Times, business leaders and educators, and many others all lavishly praised the Hope Scholarship. One favorite was a piece in the Philadelphia Inquirer where a columnist wrote about hope. It's the kind of thing you look at half in, amaz in amazement and half in anger and wonder why your own bonehead state didn't think of it. Who would have imagined that a boy who started life poor, fatherless, and isolated, yet with access to education and a strong faith, would have had a very Yankee newspaper say such things about what he accomplished. I want to close by quoting Zell himself. This was written more than 40 years ago by the man who loved words and who loved these mountains. My roots run very deep in the mountains of North Georgia. My ancestors were among the first mountain settlers. They were fiercely independent. I love the mountains in a way that is difficult to describe. They are still where I can find my greatest solace and comfort, and my desire is to return one day, to live out the remainder of my life, and be buried in this valley. His voice is silent now, and his mind is sealed. But happily, Zell's desire is fulfilled. His parting leaves a hole in the universe. But God has welcomed him home to the mountainous part of heaven, freed him of pain, and he is waiting there for the rest of us to share some cream relay. God bless you, Governor Miller. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. These are the opening words of Psalm 121 in the Bible. Many of the Psalms in the Bible were written by King David, who was born and raised in the mountains of Israel. I want to use this passage to prepare us as we consider and celebrate the life of Zell Brian Miller. Zell was born and raised in these mountains, as we have talked about, in the southern Appalachian Range. These mountains were in his blood and on his tongue as he spoke in what he called a mountain twang. Living in this valley in which young Harris is located, he would have to lift his eyes up to see the mountains around him. Zell loved words. Not only the words of the Bible, and he was fond of the stately cadences of the King James Version, but he loved the words of Shakespeare, the words of country music songs, and the words of the tall tales of the men among whom he lived as he was growing up here in Young Harris. He loved the power and wonder of words and the images that they could evoke. He was never ashamed of his speech nor of his small town upbringing, but he prized them and used them to motivate himself. The tales and legends of these mountains fired his imagination and stayed with him all of his life. He heard the captivating legends of the noble Cherokee who built a marvelous civilization in these mountains. It took eons for these mountains to be formed and shaped as they exist today. These mountains are among the oldest in the world. The forests that cover them and the diversity of wildlife that make their home here are unique in the world. Now let's be clear. Though he was born and raised in small town Georgia during the Great Depression and its aftermath, Zell was not raised on a farm as many people were. Though not from a farm family, he worked as a young'un. Nevertheless, at one time, he even did a stint at logging. He once told me that the land on which my wife and I lived was once called Pine Tree Hill. When Sharp Memorial Church decided to build a parsonage on the land, Zell and a bunch of boys from the church youth group were recruited to fell the trees and clear the land 
for the building of the parsonage. No, he wasn't raised on a farm. In fact, his folks were teachers. His father, mother, and aunt taught here at Young Harris College. Instead of crops, they grew mines. In that family, he was immersed in the great importance of learning, the importance of broadening your horizons, of exploring the world of ideas, of employing the tool of reason. You see, Zell Miller was raised in a Methodist school and in the Methodist church. The Methodist movement in Christianity is the only Christian denomination that was started in a university. Back in the mid-18th century, John Wesley began a small group ministry among some students at Oxford University in England. Their aim was to know Christ and to live Christ. Within years, the work of John Wesley and his brother Charles grew and grew into a national movement in England, mainly among the working class, the coal miners, the factory hands, and the farmers. And then it spread overseas to the American colonies and grew in the new nation of the United States of America. In the late 19th century, the Reverend Artemis Lester, a traveling Methodist preacher known as a circuit rider, crossed over the mountains and arrived in this beautiful valley. He started a Methodist school here for educating the young and encouraging them in the Christian life. He was only doing what generations of Methodists had done before and would do in the future. Just as my grandparents did as they left Barnesville, Georgia in the early 20th century to go as missionaries to Brazil and to start a school there. All of these Methodists did so for the purpose of educating the young and encouraging them in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Zell went through the usual trials and tribulations as a teenager and young adult, as many of us do, wandering away from the way that our parents had laid out for us. But three things in his life in those years helped to reorient him and bring him back into the way. First, the solid upbringing by his mother, Bertie, and his aunt, Bertie Miller. Second, a term of service in the United States Marine Corps. And third, and most important, meeting Shirley Carver of Andrews, North Carolina, whom he met here at Young Harris College. She was the love of his life and his solid rock. Going back to Psalm 121 with this imagery of surrounding mountains, I want us to note some similarity in the lives of two men raised in the mountains, King David of Israel, and Zell Miller of Young Harris, Georgia. In their younger years, both loved the freedom and pleasure of activities in the out of doors. It was archery for David and baseball for Zell. Both served in the military and that experience gave them the self-discipline that would be required for the great and serious challenges that they faced later in life. Both, both went on to high political office in the service of their respective nations. Another similarity, both were writers who loved the way in which words can weave themselves into creations that give birth in the mind of the reader. Finally, and this is the important one, there's the faith and trust in God that both David and Zell depended upon. David captures it best as he praises God in Psalm 90. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Both men came to faith in God the hard way through their flaws and failures. They knew immediately the mercy and grace of God. Psalm 25. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. Zell knew of King David. He was fascinated with the past, and that led him to become a history teacher here at Young Harris College. He probably assumed that work would be the work of his life. He was passionate about history. 
I've met a few male graduates who admitted that they came here to Young Heirs College to get away from their parents, engage in some mischief, and just get by. But once taking a history class with Mr. Miller, the scales fell from their eyes and they became serious and committed students. As we read in Proverbs 16, 9, 16 verse 9, a man's heart plans his way, but God directs his steps. This word of wisdom applies not only to those students, but it applies to their teacher as well. God directed Zell's steps, away from teaching history to making it. He lived with a vivid awareness of the past and what he owed to those who inhabited the past and who went before him. He knew he owed them a great debt, but he also lived with an aching, heartfelt concern for the future, fearing what it may bring. No matter what the future may hold, whether bright and clear or dark and foreboding, our trust must be in God, who has shown the world his love for us in Jesus Christ. In Christ, God forgives us, and through Christ, God gives us the gift of eternal life. In Christ, death is not the end. It's not the final say-so. The good news of Christ encourages us, but it also challenges us to live a life of humility before God. And it challenges us to love others. To live for Christ is to live for something greater than yourself and gives you the opportunity to join with others in transforming the world for God in Jesus Christ. Then you'll be able to understand what the prophet Micah encourages. What does the Lord require of you but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? So many of us find it impossible to believe that the precious phenomenon of human life ends at death. Rather, we see death as but a doorway to enter into a grander realm of existence, into the fullness of God. This we Christians hold as central to our faith. We know that God holds us accountable for the lives that we live, but we also know that through Christ Jesus, God lovingly gives us what we do not deserve, that is God's grace, and God withholds from us what we do deserve, and that is a sign of God's mercy. It would be remiss if I failed to note that we are in Holy Week, culminating in the glorious good news of Easter, that Jesus Christ has risen and ended the finality of death. Death does not have the last word. Life does. Eternal life. This week in which we acknowledge the death of Zell Miller and celebrate his life, we also rejoice that his life goes on into eternity in the fullness of God. David was close with God. In his youth, David was a shepherd tending the sheep of his father. As a young adult, David spent years in military service, first as a soldier, then as a general, and finally becoming king of Israel. In fact, acknowledged as the greatest king ever. It was probably while king that he had time to sit down with his memories and compose some of the most beautiful and evocative poetry that the world has ever known. His poems, collected in the book of Psalms in the Bible, span the full gamut of human emotion, from gloom and despair to joy and ecstasy, from crippling guilt to firm assurance. In the Psalms, David bears his heart to God. He is vulnerable and transparent before God. And his mind wandered back to his younger years in the valleys and mountains of his youth, he recalled the simple pleasure of tending sheep on a spring day. Suffused with nostalgia, he composed his most famous poem, 
the 23rd Psalm, with this imagery of tending sheep, except it is the Lord God who is the shepherd. The poem turns dark and foreboding, enemies, evil, and death intrude, but by the end, security and peace are assured. It goes like this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray. Teach us, Lord, to live life in your abundance, but not to hold on to life too tightly. You have given life as a gift to enjoy while we have it, and to be let go gracefully when our time comes. Your gift is great, but you, the giver, are greater still. O oh God, the helper of the helpless, comfort our mourning hearts. In your holy keeping are both the living and the dead. Enable us to return after this service to our duties and tasks and to do so with less trust in ourselves and more trust in you. May we serve your holy will and live our lives now in the spirit of him who was made perfect in suffering, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Go now in the blessing of Almighty God, the great three in one, now and forever. Amen.